let's continue. Chapter 27 begins with a comic, carnivalesque, even lascivious tone, but it ends on a very serious note. At the inn in the Sierra Morena, the priest constructs his costume, asking the innkeeper's wife to lend him a skirt and a bodice from the time of King Wamba. In other words, the early medieval period before the Reconquista. A set of garments that the narrator describes in great detail. Strips of black velvet all slashed and a bodice of green velvet trimmed with white satin. What could this set of colors symbolize? The priest covers his face with a veil and rides atop a mule, side saddle, like a woman, a mujeriegas. Meanwhile, the barber is disguised with a great beard fashioned out of a gray or red oxtail in which the innkeeper had hung his comb. The innkeeper's comb stuck in his wife's oxtail is a highly sexualized image, and she will say so explicitly when she requests it back in a future episode. As a final touch to the scene, Maritornes, who had witnessed the priest's transformation, promised to pray a rosary even though she was sinful, so that God might grant them success in such an arduous and such a Christian enterprise as was the one they had undertaken. Her promise is another comical critique of formal religion. Recalling Cervantes' abuse of the free and direct style at the end of the previous chapter, it is worth asking if these words belong to the narrator or Maritornes. And what about this Christian enterprise upon which Don Quixote's friends have embarked? Cervantes seems to signal some extreme, almost grotesque, reformist interpretation of Christianity. Recall that in the previous episode at the same inn, Maritornes had tried to have sex with a relative of Cide Amete. Moreover, the only other rosary we have seen until now was soiled, and now, Right after the sinful Maritornes promises to pray, Cervantes again references the issue of religious decorum. Upon leaving the inn, the priest changes his mind and says he does not want to play the part of a woman because it was an indecent thing for a priest to dress that way. He now insists that the barber be the distressed damsel and he would be her squire, and thus his dignity would be less profaned. In fact, the priest makes his decision on moral grounds because he will not proceed in that manner even if the devil were to make off with Don Quixote. At this point, Sancho appears and cannot help laughing at what he sees. What does this laughter mean in this context? Note here how the narrative is woven together in a way that parallels its content. At the very least, its elusive form reinforces the theme of reality versus appearances. The priest removes his disguise. The barber refuses to dress as a woman until they find Don Quixote. And Sancho tells them both the story of the madman of the Sierra Morena. According to the narrator, Sancho does this concealing, however, the finding of the traveling case and all its contents. For even though he was foolish, the man was also somewhat greedy. Similarly, the plan is to convince Don Quixote to leave the Sierra Morena, and the priest and the barber have to explain this to Sancho, but not entirely. They say that what they are doing will make it easier for Don Quixote to become an emperor or a monarch. On top of this, Sancho now implores them to prevent his master from being satisfied with the status of archbishop because he was of the opinion that when it came to rewarding their squires, emperors were capable of more than archbishops errant. A day later, the three come to where Sancho had left some branches that would guide him back to Don Quixote. While Sancho fetches his master, the priest and the barber wait next to a rock by a stream, yet another locus amenus. Suddenly, the two hear a voice singing verses, not those of rustic farmers, but of discreet courtiers. The poem is divided into three stanzas, and its themes are those that dominate nearly all the novel's poems, jealousy, passionate madness, and the lack of any remedy. Priest and Barber then listen to the same unknown musician sing the novel's second sonnet. But wait, there is something very different about this poem. For the first time in the novel, a lyric focuses not on love, but on sacred friendship. Moreover, 
though not entirely optimistic, the poem clarifies a problem and then indicates its solution. The problem is that there are two types of friendship, true and false. True friendship has a certain power. You signal for us the just peace covered by a veil. Although there are still people who pretend to do good when in fact they are evil. In the end, the poetic voice implores true friendship to reveal itself because otherwise the consequences will be horrific. Come down from heaven, friendship. Don't allow deceit to don your regalia's colors by which it destroys sincere intentions. If you'll not reclaim your semblance somehow, we'll soon see our world overcome by wars, lost in discord's original dissensions. The musician turns out to be Cardenio, and the priest approaches our thoughtful man and begs him to give up this utterly miserable life. The narrator informs us that Cardenio was then in possession of his judgment, free of that furious inflection which so often deprived him of himself. And when he addresses Don Quixote's friends, we learn that he knows full well that he suffers some psychological malady. He says, Many have tried to convince him to leave the Sierra, but he refuses because he is not fit for normal life. He even states that the power of imagining his misfortunes sometimes makes him turn to stone and do terrible things without being aware. In other words, Cardenio has been hiding out in the Sierra Morena both to escape his personal frustrations and to avoid doing damage to others during his nervous attacks. For now, his only remedy is to tell his troubles to those who will listen. And so he relates the rest of what happened to Fernando and Lucinda, resuming right where he had left off a few days ago. A couple of observations here, one thematic and the other formal. First, notice again the profound influence that Cervantes had on Freud. Cardenio clearly suffers from some mental disorder, specifically fainting spells that leave blanks in his memory. He states that the only remedy for that terrible inflection is to tell his story to anyone who will listen. This anticipates, by about 300 years, both the theory and the practice of psychoanalysis. Second, during the encounter between Don Quixote's friends and Cardenio, Cervantes deploys certain grammatical slips, taking advantage of certain words' double meanings. That is, here the text becomes excessively Baroque. For example, Cardenio says the following when he realizes that two strangers are already familiar with his life, which he perceives as a miracle. Gentlemen, whoever you may be, I can see that heaven has sent me some people who, placing before my eyes with vivid and various reasons how much I lack by living the life that I do, have attempted to get me from this to a better place. Notice that the demonstrative this anticipates a better place, but also alludes back to the word life in the preceding clause, and that how much I lack means how much reason I am without, appropriating the earlier word and even transforming its original meaning from the plural statements to the singular logic. This sentence contains not one, but two examples of the syntactic figure known as theugma, whereby distinct parts of a sentence are linked together by a common element. And Cardenio employs the same figure again when he asks the priest and the barber that you listen to the tale, which has none, of my tribulations. Here tale means story, but in the next phrase, which has none, the pronoun none also refers to tale, but in the sense of ending. The original Spanish is just as convoluted. In short, we have a series of theogmas constructed around such keywords as life, reason, and tale. Many critics claim that Cervantes is original because he writes in a fluid, spontaneous manner. They are deceiving themselves.